learned and we've replicated that over um, uh, during course design when we work with other faculty to help them achieve both QM and uh, certification, which has worked really well for us. So today we're going to share that with you. So um, what we're going to head into next is going to be a course map. So this was basically our starting point. And um, this is always our starting point when we work with the faculty is just using a course map. Here for this demonstration, we're showing you the course map using half sheets that we put on a wall. Um, but basically to guide this process, you could use, um, again, any quality assurance instrument. Here we used QM for Professor Ortega's course. And it focused on the, or, what we had on the left hand side were the critical course components and that was how we laid this out to help guide the process. So I just want to let you know this was a course that we built from the ground up. Um, so we took a little bit more time during the course map process. This is something you can also do in a Word document, but if you already have your course structured and you've already got your activities, your objectives, your assessments, I would recommend just plugging all those things in a course map to start with because the true benefit here is that it allows you to just step back and identify any areas that um, you may be able to improve or any gaps that exist within your course anything with alignment um, or any technologies you might want to update or change to facilitate the design process. So here are a couple of images just to show you what that visual process looked like. But again, you can do this in, in a Word document. And so here, um, basically, again, the true value is just that um, whatever instrument you're using um, really helps to guide that process. Um, there's a lot of benefit to using one of the instruments um, to guide the design process and it really does allow you to just step back and help you make any um, or identify any areas that that can use improvement or any gaps that exist um, in the course. So the next thing we did from here, um, basically we began to put it all together in um, a course template. So this was the first one that you see there on the left hand side um, is the course template that was shared to us by um, our amazing instructional design colleagues over at Cal Poly Pomona. So they were um, super sweet and generous enough to um, share this with us. And what we did is we took this template and we customized it. So that's the one that you see over to the right. And that's what we've been using when we work with faculty. And all these areas can be customized um, to fit the um, teaching style of the faculty. But we start off with this template here on the right. And we've just customized it to really fit the needs of our university, our faculty, and our students. So what Cal Poly Pomona shared with us really gave us a great start. Um, so now we're going to take you through these, through the template, just so that you can see what's included in each area. So the template includes three distinct areas, and this first one here is the getting started section. So the getting started section really contains just all of the startup information. Um, everything that your students need to know to get started and the syllabus, the contact your instructor information, university policies, accessibility information. So all the startup information before they get into like the meat of, and potatoes of the course where we're, they're going to really be spending the majority of the time. So you set the expectations here, you give them all that startup information. And this section here, um, we don't have Colt. Um, the CSU instrument, which is quality learning and teaching. We have QM listed here. But this first section, um, once you start to add the content in these areas, satisfy, will satisfy quite a few of the QM and Colt standards. And I'm sure if there are other rubrics that some of you might be using, will satisfy quite a, quite a few of those. Um, so you'll see here for QM 1.1, 1.2, 1.8, 1.9. The next section, um, and here's, here's an example of um, Professor Ortega that she had in that getting started. So on her welcome landing page, um, she has a nice introduction video. 
And then down below that, you'll see an example. And feel free to, you know, capture, do a screen capture if you if you want. She's um, totally fine with all this being shared. Um, she's very generous and more than willing to share this with everyone and anyone. Um, but this is a nice little introduce yourself to the class um, video assignment that she gives um, at the very beginning of the class for students to help build that, that community and to help students get to know each other. The second section here is the um, section where the, your students are going to be spending the majority of their time. So this is where all of their learning, of, uh, their course materials, their assessments, um, their assignments, everything is, is in this middle section here. They'll check their grades, they'll have access to rubrics, so they're clear about, you know, um, how their, their assignments are going to be graded. So all that is here and organized in the center section. And you can see also by the navigation panel or this template that we're using here, um, the links, all the links are very descriptive. So they really do help guide the students to access the information that you want them to access very quickly because they're very descriptive. So weekly learning activities lets them know that all their weekly learning activities for that week will be in that link there. Um, and again, we don't have a quote listed here, um, but it does satisfy um, quite a few of the QM standards. Um, it, once you're building out your content in these sections, um, such as 2.3, 4.2, 5.2 QM, several of the cult um, objectives as well, and I'm sure of the other, um, other instruments that you might be using. So then we go down to the last section, which is the technical support. Let me just, sorry, let me back up really quickly. Um, so for this middle section, this is what the weekly learning activities looks like in, in this particular course that we were, um, that we're demonstrating for the purpose of today's um, webinar. But it, it, you can change this. You can include the objectives inside the folders, inside the modules, but you can see that it's very um, nicely laid out. There's consistency across modules. The course learning objectives are right at the top every time the students enter the weekly learning activities. Those are listed there. And if you look at module one, where it says the module learning objectives, MLO one, if you just go right across that to the far right, you have in parentheses it says aligned with CLO two and five. So right there we have, um, made that very clear and outlined um, the alignment as far as the, the first objective aligning with course level objective two and five up above. So you can do it that way. You can also do it within the module. There's different ways of approaching it, but um, just an example to show you. So then the last section of the course template is the smallest section, but super helpful. Um, it's the technical support section, which gives our students and the instructor um, quick access to Blackboard help tutorials and guides and tips, as well as a 24-7 technical support line. So typically, our Blackboard courses, we use Blackboard as the LMS, they come with um, a basic generic template. And we work with faculty to create these, uh, this layout here. And we will rename the support um, link because it typically says Blackboard help. And we rename it to read 24 seven technical support. So again, just making sure that the links are very descriptive and helpful. This template here during this current transition that we're going through since camp, you know, our campus has been closed a lot of them, if not all of them, have been closed and have transitioned face-to-face -to, -face to um, online. So I have just in the last week copied this template over um, by request to, I believe it's been between 70 to 80 courses for our faculty just in one week. And all the feedback that I've received has been extremely positive. It's given them a great start. 
and it has saved them a tremendous amount of time just organizing it, um, organizing or having their, this template so that they have a structure. So I highly recommend creating some kind of a template or starting with a template and feel free again to screenshot this and build this in your LMS. All right. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Uh, just quickly, Tracy, uh, we have some people asking for the materials. Is it all right if I just provide the um, Spark link for them? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yep. Um, and in the chat, what I will do is um, I'll include my direct email too. If you want to jump on, um, I know we're going through a very difficult time right now with transition and there's a lot of stress and anxiety and frustration. And so really our goal is just to help as much as we can. Um, we still remember when we went online for the first time and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an easy transition. So we all provide my email in the chat. Feel free to email me. If you don't have a support team on campus and you know, you feel like you're alone, just send me an email. I can jump on a quick Zoom um, meeting with you and I can at least do what I can to help you through the transition and then provide you with any resources you need. So please feel free to reach out to me. So I'll send that through the chat right now. Thank you, Tracy. Um, all right, uh, just to, to quickly, uh, we are gonna try to save more of the questions in the Q&A till the end. Um, but if I see something on there that, that seems convenient to answer where we're at, I might just do that. So I, I do see the question that says, oh, all of our courses use this course template. Um, no, 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 they don't. Um, we're working right now with uh, the Blackboard admins and things to develop a better template because uh, currently the Blackboard template that we use is very basic. Um, it doesn't have nearly any of the uh, resources and assets that this has. It's really just a blank shell where, where faculty can start um, building things. Uh, but our goal is to hopefully be able to implement a more full uh, or complete template, especially with these technical support and, and some of the other resources. Um, all right, so Tracy just talked a lot about the process that she went through with um, Dr. Delia uh, Ortega in order to get this course ready to go. And it, it was a lot of information crammed into a small spot, right? She, she talked about 15 minutes and made it seem like it was an easy process. I can promise you it was not. Um, and it, it took quite a bit of time and effort on both the parts, both the faculty and as well as the design team uh, to get that set up. So we wanted to just kind of talk about some of the tips and tools, things that we learned from these experiences um, that will hopefully guide you and, and make the process a little bit smoother uh, should you ever decide to go through building a quality online course. Um, okay, so the first thing is the course map. Tracy talked about the course map. Um, it doesn't have to be with the half sheets, um, pin up things like she mentioned. That's just what worked well for the um, tech knowledge of, of that particular faculty, right? She wasn't someone who was super tech savvy. So utilizing Google Docs and other things um, to visualize that course map just wasn't gonna work for her. So that was the, the route that we had chosen because uh, it fit her skill set the best. But essentially a course map is just a visualization of your class, right? It's an ability um, to see everything that you're putting in there, all of the content, all of the assessments, all the learning activities, uh, and get that kind of whole view of the course, as well as being able to then break it out and see, okay, how do each one of these modules connect to the, the larger learning objectives of the course um, and create that alignment, which is super important for the, uh, for the quality design. Bloom's taxonomy, uh, we use this one pretty heavily in our office. I know um, it, it's, it's met with mixed results from faculty, but it, what I really love it for is it makes it so that your learning objectives are always clear, concise, and, and most importantly, measurable. Um, by using this as our guide, uh, not necessarily the blueprint, but at least a guide to send us in the right direction. Um, it just makes sure that, that we're A, capturing um, the terminology that's specific to the learning level that we're teaching to, um, but that also that these learning objectives become measurable. Uh, and at the end, we can say, yes, we met this objective or no, we did not. Uh, using some sort of quality assurance instrument. Um, in this case, Tracy mentioned it a few times, the main instrument was the QM rubric. So having that rubric in mind when you're going into design, excuse me, um, so that you have all the standards in place. Uh, and it's not an afterthought. It's something that um, is implemented from the very beginning and, and can be designed accordingly. 
And then we just talked about it, create and use a template. Um, the template that we have up here, uh, I think is, is a great start. The main difference for me, I talked a little bit about the blank template that gets given to our faculty as it is. Um, I think there's pros and cons, right? The pros to the blank uh, template is it allows the faculty to implement their own creative um, assets and see, okay, how do I want to design this course without so much of the restrictions? Uh, the problem is oftentimes when you give people a template, it becomes natural for them to try to just use that template that you provided with them. So currently the template that we give them, you often see faculty will just put things in content and things in information because that's what's built for them. And they don't even realize that they can change some of those things and really uh, structure their course in a way that's more beneficial, not only for them and being able to organize and their thoughts and, and get it out there, but for the students to be able to access it. Um, they're not now instead of going to one folder that says information and trying to paw through uh, you know, 50, 100 different readings that you have in there for the entire course, they can go specifically to the module, uh, to the weekly level learning objectives and then each module have exactly what they need for that specific week. Um, there are definitely pros and cons to using a template, but it, it goes a long way to getting a lot of the consistent stuff that's gonna be in every class. Um, in there without you having to do too much of the work. So it takes a little bit of, of the tedious stuff out. So things like student resources for either students with disabilities or maybe it's a writing lab or a computer lab. Uh, these sort of things are, are generally consistent throughout the entire university uh, and not specific to any one individual course. So having a template with all of these already built in just takes that out of the, uh, the building process and the design process and allows us to focus on the other things um, that take a little bit more time. All right, just a couple tips uh, to go through that we kind of encountered that helped us. Uh, have all the course elements organized in a folder on your computer. I, I think this is helpful twofold. Uh, the first reason is one, it makes the just the logistics of building the course a lot easier because instead of trying to search for five or different folders on your computer just to track down those documents, uh, everything's in the same place. It's already there. We would open up a document that said our folder that said module one and all of your documents would be there. We're ready to upload them to Blackboard or Canvas or whatever your LMS happens to be. Uh, for us obviously it's Blackboard. Um, but the other thing that this does, and I think the more important thing that this does, is it gives you an opportunity to start the organization process even without any knowledge of the LMS. Um, oftentimes I know that that can be a struggle if someone's not familiar, especially with Blackboard, if somebody's not familiar with Blackboard, uh, being able to quickly pick it up and use it is not something that, um, that happens too often, right? It is kind of a complex uh, LMS in comparison to some of the other competitors. Um, so being able to organize everything on your folder first allows you to see, okay, maybe in week three, you notice, oh, I have a lot of readings here. I have a lot of assignments. This is a heavy week. Can we chunk this out differently? Um, it's just a, a good prep work. Get your mind going in the way that you need to be for how we're going to organize and design the course, um, as well as giving you an opportunity to kind of see everything in that visual aspect uh, before we get into the LMS. Consistency. Uh, this is more just a, a large overarching topic for me, right? Um, especially in an online world, uh, online or hybrid. Hybrid, you're allowed a little bit more freedom, I guess, because you do have those face-to-face -face meetings, those opportunities uh, to clear up anything. Uh, but consistency goes a long way uh, in the online world. By doing things like creating a section overview that we saw in the top piece there um, and setting expectations in between each one of them, you're helping your students build that behavior pattern, that okay, I know every week I have to do a reading and a discussion board and a reflective journal or a quiz or whatever it is, right? Whatever the, the assignments are for that week, having them be consistent throughout the week reduces the chances of your students absentmindedly forgetting about something or not getting an assignment simply because they just didn't know it was there and it wasn't made clear to them. Um, Every week they'll know, okay, these are the tasks that I'm supposed to do. We're gonna see in a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit about student testimonials. That's one of the things that the students really do enjoy um, about the quality courses that we've been setting up is that consistency, that, that behavior building pattern. Um, obviously there's gonna be some exceptions to that. Like if you have a midterm or a final or some culminating project at the end, uh, that's gonna throw a wrench into that consistency of the weeks, but uh, doing it as much as possible um, goes, goes a long way with the students. Um, the other category that I like to wrap this in, uh, in the last two categories that kind of include all of these, so we're gonna to touch on them as I go through them. Um, one is instructor presence. Uh, I think this is, is, is huge. Um, and one of the things that often gets overlooked in designing an online course. Um, 
because it comes naturally in a face-to-face -face environment, right? Your, your, your presence as an instructor in a face-to-face -face environment is, is you're there, you're, you're teaching them, you're lecturing, you're the person at the front of the class that everybody's sitting there and paying attention to. Uh, in an online class that doesn't happen, and a lot of times it feels like it's just, it, online classes can be very isolating. It feels like it's just the student kind of sitting here in front of their computer and struggling through the content on their own. Um, and they can feel like they don't have that same support from an expert like yourself, the faculty. Uh, so creating that instructor presence, and that can be done in a couple different ways. You can do that with micro lectures. These are little short mini, mini videos, uh, two to three minutes. You don't want to go too long because then the student's attention spans um, start to waver and, and you may lose them there. But short videos uh, that either uh, wrap up a topic, uh, clarifies a few of the key terms and topics uh, or areas that you guys talked about. Um, maybe it's an introduction to the topic. So the beginning of every week, you're doing something like telling them, hey, today or this week, we're going to talk about this, this, and this. Pay close and special attention to this, this, and this. Um, or it could be uh, welcome and intro videos, right? We usually highly recommend the instructors who are doing a fully online course um, to do a, a, a welcome video. Uh, what this does is it puts a face and a voice to the name and the email, right? They, maybe they're communicating with you via email, but this it's a humanizing effect, right? It, it creates this feeling that they're not just dealing with computers and wires and that they're all alone, but that there is a human person on the other end who is invested and dedicated to their support and their success. So um, just doing things to make sure that we get your face out there, we get your name out there, we get your voice out there. Um, similar to like this here, right? Making sure that you guys can see my face so that you know I'm not just some robot behind the scenes um, or the man behind the curtain type of thing. Creating that presence though is, is huge in an online class. Um, setting expectations, we talked a little bit about that with the consistency, right? Having those agendas, uh, having that schedule of events, if you will, um, and setting those expectations throughout each week uh, so that the students know what they need to do in order to be successful. Um, and then the third category that's I'm going to kind of include all of these in here is communication. It's something we're experiencing. Um, a lot right now in this transition. Uh, I don't know about the rest of everyone else's universities, but at CSUSB, we are moving 100% of our spring 2020 quarter courses into a virtual environment or online environment or distance learning environment, whichever term you want to call it. Um, in my opinion, I think it's more distance learning than anything else, but uh, we're moving 100% of them online. And we are, I think technically should be one week into the quarter, but we've delayed it one week and we are already getting just an influx of emails um, students, faculty, just basically saying, we need more communication. We need more ways to keep in touch, right? Uh, in this, especially in this time of crisis, when everything is changing on, it seems like a daily basis, communication is key and it is mandatory, essentially, um, in an online environment. that <laughs> over spring break. Um, as well as this feedback, providing feedback to your students. I know from a student's perspective, from my own ex experience, it's one of the most infuriating things that I've ever experienced in the class is when you get a grade back, and even if there's only a couple points knocked off, or sometimes even if it's a perfect grade, if I don't get that, like that feedback is the opportunity for the instructor to have their interaction, have their presence known the most heavily, right? Because the students are looking to you as the expert. So um, being able to provide any type of feedback, even if it's highlights some of the areas that the student was successful in, um, is really important because they no longer have that face-to-face -face environment where they can just come to you after class or something and say, hey, I just want to talk to you about this. A, a lot of those spontaneous kind of impromptu conversations no longer take place. Uh, and so we have to facilitate other ways of getting that communication across. So um, of these all tips, of all three of these tips, the the three main categories that I would break them into and the three most important things I would say is organization is key, both organization of your content before you start building and organization of the content once we build it into the course as demonstrated by the template above here. Um, the third one is instructor presence, making sure that you're known um, or that, you, that, that your presence is felt, um, that the students know that there is somebody else who's a real life person on the other end. Um, who's going through this process with them. Uh, and the third being communication, right? So if you hit those three things, utilizing some of the tips that we have here, uh, I think you'll be off to a, a pretty good start. All right, um, originally when this was designed, uh, this was meant to be a face-to-face -face workshop. And at this point, I would open this up to uh, all of you and ask you, you know, what does a poorly designed and taught online course 
uh, look and feel like. And if you have some answers, please feel free to, to throw them in the chat. However, I don't know time-wise if I'm going to be able to, to kind of stick around. So um, I just kind of thought of it from my perspective. I, I am taking online courses currently. Um, and for me, a poorly designed um, online course um, looks a lot for me, from my own personal experience, it can be very isolating. Um, it, it feels like you're kind of stuck going through that material by yourself without the support of your peers and without the support of the instructor. You just, you feel like you're going at it alone. Um, and then it's compounded and made even worse if you don't know how to navigate or access the course. If some of the expectations aren't clear and you're really not even sure what you're supposed to do or how to do it. Uh, to me, that leaves me in a feeling of helplessness. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty self-motivated learner. I like to go out there and learn things on my own. Um, so I, you know, online classes are absolutely my cup of tea. Um, but when they are done poorly, it's still very frustrating and, and struggling experience. Um, exactly. So we we had somebody um, in the chat that says a poorly designed online course is like being lost in the woods. That is exactly how I would describe it. Right? You know, you need to do something but you're not sure where you need to go to even get in the right direction. Um, you're just surrounded by trees. Uh, I think that's a great, great um, input. But yeah, so all of these things that we've talked about, <laughs> it sounds like I'm not the only one who agrees um, that that's a, a great um, interpretation of what a poorly designed online course would look like. Um, and absolutely, it could be too much too, right? If you try to cram too much into one space, uh, that can be overwhelming and especially it, I'm noticing this a lot more in this particular crisis with the coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, you're getting a, a mass move to this online environment, but the knowledge for that move isn't necessarily there, right? And that could be knowledge on, you know, maybe if we're talking to faculty, how to design online activities and things like that, or it could be knowledge of something as simple as not knowing how to use Zoom or one of the tools that is now becoming a critical backbone of that online environment. Um, throwing too many things on at once uh, it, it can have a negative impact as well of just being overwhelming and, and drawing away from what the purpose of, of what we're trying to accomplish is. Um, so sometimes keeping it simple is, is the better way uh, to go about it. All right, so the next thing we have here is just some um, student testimonials. Uh, and these are some uh, for the uh, class that Delia Ortega uh, had taught afterwards we gave a survey just to get the students perspective on the design and, and the course in general um, it's a common practice that we do with new redesigns as just part of the iterative process of continuing to improve right we're never going to be perfect on the first go around um, so getting feedback from the students of what we could do better is just a good design practice uh, in general but essentially um, and you can read through these I'm not going to read them off to you guys exactly but um, the consensus was uh, overwhelmingly positive in, in the feedback. Um, and the few things that they mentioned, I uh, just made some notes so that I didn't have to read through all of them. Uh, the few things that they highlighted in these testimonials were comments regarding the organization of the course, right? The layout, how easy it was to access the content um, and know what they were expected to do. Um, and the ability to express their own thoughts and communicate. Um, I'm sorry, the ability to communicate with their peers and express their own thoughts in the discussion board. Um, where's just a few of the things that they mentioned, but all of it revolves around the same practices and principles that we're displaying in this workshop. Um, those were all the things that essentially they found the most value out of. Uh, I do see a question in the Q&A about uh, sharing that student survey. That I'm not sure. We have to kind of touch base and see if, I'm sure those results probably still exist. We just have to be able to track them down uh, and be able to share them. All right. Um, so just, just real quickly, I liked how there were videos that were relatable. Um, I also liked the discussion boards. I liked how everything was broken down into weeks. So whatever uh, that needed to be accomplished or was learned was in that folder and we didn't have to go searching everywhere, right? So a one-stop shop for them, essentially. Uh, they click on week one and they have not only their readings, but all of their assessments, their learning activities, their assignments, um, as well as links to the discussion board and, and things like that. All right. Um, All right, so as we're getting kind of close to the end here, these are just some um, lessons learned, right? Some things that, that we came up um, after going through this process a few times uh, that we said, you know, what? These, are, these are some of the tips and tricks that, that might come in handy for somebody who is going through this uh, relatively new. Uh, obviously start early, 
the first few here uh, out of the gates, I would say, are pretty straightforward. Start early, include everyone on your team. For us, this was including people like our accessibility, um, rather than just reaching out to them when we needed something captioned, bringing them in on the ground level, letting them know what's going on. Um, because a lot of the times they may have different tools, different strategies um, and techniques to approach a certain thing. And if you wait till the last minute to bring them in, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to do some of those things. So bringing everyone in and um, getting everybody on board right from the beginning, time management and communication, uh, just as, those two things are important to your student's success in the actual class. They're also important to have uh, in mind in building the course out. Um, so structured timeline, 100% commitment. Uh, have a good understanding of QM and designing with the standards in mind. This goes back to using that tool that we talked about, or those QA instruments that we talked about, right? So having that rubric up and ready um, so that none of the standards come out of left field. You're not caught off guard and have to drastically change the organization um, or any of the, the content layout. Having those rubrics, those standards uh, present while you're building it saves you a lot of time on the back end trying to retrofit a course to, to meet those standards. Um, and then the most important thing, in my opinion at least, is always keep the student's perspective and experience in mind, right? Everything that we do here, I mean, my role is, into, is in assisting faculty, uh, but it's to allow the, it's, that assisting is to allow the faculty to assist the students, right? The goal of every university is student success. Without the students, we don't have much, uh, anything going on there. So um, always keeping their experience in mind and not necessarily necessarily like catering to it or dumbing things down for their success, but, but making sure that their success is in the forefront uh, of everything that we're doing. So that the things that we do are built behind student success. And then an informal QM course review before and after. Uh, this is something that we do just to make sure we've kind of dotted our I's, crossed our T's. Uh, we do informal reviews before and after just to make sure, uh, give us the best chance of, of passing those formal reviews where there's a little less stake, a little less at stake. All right. And then just real quickly in closing, uh, this is some of the things that the faculty identified as values in this process, right? So this was after the end of it. These are some of the things that Dr. Delia Ortega uh, identified as um, the key values that she kind of took out of this uh, course design process. Uh, and the first one was rethinking pedagogy. A lot of time when you do a design from the ground up because we're switching modalities or if it's a redesign because you've taught it in a while, it allows you, it gives you a chance to take a fresh look um, at the course content, right? Maybe, I know a lot of faculty kind of have, uh, at least in my experience at CSUSB, we do a lot of course copies. So you're using the same content that you used last spring. And I understand that a lot of that is because of time. And if it's taught the same, that that's um, just the smart way to go about it. Uh, however, getting an opportunity to take a fresh look at the content, the alignment, the different assessments that you have can be a good way to, uh, to change things for the better, right? Mix things up. Um, if you're gonna take the time to rebuild and redesign a course, uh, do it from the ground up and make sure that, that you're getting everything the way you want it. Uh, importance of alignment, that, that's key in almost any quality uh, assurance type of certification, certification, things like that. But I think it's also just important in general. And I think a lot of times it's overlooked. Um, for me, the alignment, the focus on alignment allows us to get rid of a lot of the, the busy work that, that happens to find their way into courses. Um, things that we're having them do because we feel like they need to do them. Having this alignment and asking, going through each one of our learning activities and our assessments and asking, okay, how does this contribute to one of our module level or course level learning objectives um, and making sure that it does and if it doesn't, you know, get, get rid of it or, or re, redefining, retweaking kind of what the purpose of that particular learning activity or assignment is. Um, and then these three are the big ones for me. Um, enhance student engagement, improve the student experience, and improve the other student's understanding of course expectations and navigation. All three of those things point us in the right direction to get towards student success, right? The, the purpose of, of designing a good quality online course is we don't want the students to struggle with navigation of the course or trying to find the material or understanding what their expectations are their efforts should be on the material, on the content itself. And so doing a lot of the things that we've mentioned in this presentation uh, goes a long way to enhancing these areas and ultimately um, supporting student success. Uh, and I think with that, that will conclude the presentation portion of this. And at this point we can open it up
to Q&A unless you had anything else you'd like to add, Tracy. Nope, I think we could just move into Q&A if there are any questions. And I've um, provided my email in the chat. So like I said, please feel free um, to send me an email if you need any help. I know this is a tough time right now. We're all going through transition and dealing with a lot of stress, anxiety, frustration, both in our personal and professional lives. I know we all have a lot going on. So um, anything I could do to help, I've provided my email in the chat field for you. All right, and I'm just gonna run through these Q and A's in order as they kind of came out. Tracy, if you have the link to the Spark, if you could provide that for them in the chat, the link I provided apparently doesn't work. So uh, maybe the link that you have that, that you sent to me, uh, we can put in the chat so that people can have access to that Spark. Um, yeah. Do you remind faculty to remove duplicate links in the nav menu? We have faculty who forget to remove links above the template. Um, yeah, so as a just a default rule of thumb when I'm doing course copies for faculty, after I do the course copy, I will make a, a mention or a note that says, hey, remember, you have to remove any content that was left over from the old one. Um, if I'm having extra time, which isn't something I've had a lot of recently, I, I might go through there and do that for them, delete the old stuff. Um, because like I said, our template right now is very basic, but uh, we do remind them to do things like update your due dates and update the, the content areas and things like that. Uh, though that doesn't mean we don't have the, the people who forget as well. Um, it looks like, Tracy, they're also asking if we can share the survey. Um, that might be something we have to pull together a little bit later. I don't know if you have that off, offhand. So the survey, um, the survey is something that we actually build into the Blackboard course using the survey tool. And um, it just consists of some questions, um, just really narrowed down to specific areas such as um, were the objectives um, made clear to you? Um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. They're not going to be exact, but, um, you know, was, you know, was the navigation, um, was it easy to navigate or did you find any difficulty navigating the course? And if so, what were the challenges? Um, so just very specific. Um, and I think that they were mostly geared toward those core elements of, um, that we used when mapping out the course. So, um, did you find the technology that we that was used to facilitate the assignments helpful and something that can be used in, you know, outside of the classroom, maybe in your work environment? Um, so just questions like that, but we, we had it built in, um, so we wouldn't be able to, and we didn't have a screenshot, I'm sorry, in the presentation, um, but yeah, it was something that we built in using the survey tool in Blackboard. All right. Um... The other question here looks like it's based on the presentation as well. I don't, Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we have this in a PDF or PowerPoint slide at the moment. It's just under Adobe Spark, correct? Yeah, it's just under Adobe Spark and I just sent out the link. So if you copy and paste that in um, a window, a browser window, you should be able to access it. All right, and it says, what is the timeline and sharing of responsibility with the instructor? Example, after initial meeting. Um, Tracy, do you want to go ahead and take that one about the timeline for working with the faculty? Um, so that's kind of, that's always hard to answer um, because there is no, you know, just a clear answer for that one. It's going to vary um, based on the amount of work that's required and what kind of follow-up things. So there's, there's definitely going to be a lot of back and forth. Um, I know that um, one of our faculty, our faculty associate at Cal State San Bernardino um, has an actual article um, where the number of hours to design a fully online course, um, I think it's a minimum of 160 hours um, dedicated. And so it's going to obviously vary depending on how much is already developed. If it's a course that it's brand new and you're developing from the ground up, it's gonna take a little bit longer. But when you start with resources such as a course map, um, you use Blooms or some other taxonomy to help you establish those objectives at the modular level or the course level or both. Um, and, and use that also to create um, 
assessments that align and support the achievement of those objectives. Um, and you use other tools such as um, the instrument to guide the process, whatever quality assurance instrument that may be, and um, do a internal review so that you can kind of try to identify as you as you work through some of those gaps and things that you can that you can refine definitely helps out a lot but there is you know that's always hard for me to answer to give you know an actual timeline because it does vary but i will say that when you start work on a on a course um it has to be um basically all in all parties involved need to be fully committed to the process and um, because it let's just say it's a faculty working with a designer um, or a faculty working with a designer and an accessibility specialist and an and a videographer so depending on how many people are involved everybody holds a piece to the puzzle um, you know there's no doubt that this really does take a community to build and it's much more difficult for a faculty member that's on their own and doesn't have that support when building a course. But when you are working with other folks, um, it, it is a lot of back and forth. So everybody needs to be committed. So expectations at the very beginning with the group are really important to make sure that everybody um, is responsive and keeping the flow of this moving forward. Thank you, Tracy. Um, it looks like uh, we have a question from Professor Bishop. Um, I have my content published by weeks. How the students say they are confused and looking for the assignments because they don't remember what week the assignment was in. Is there a way to make the, a better experience? Um, a few things that I've done in the past, um, or I guess one thing, is having it in those folders. And if that's something specifically that your students are looking for, if, if they need access to those assignments, having those assignments broken out as a separate folder, right? So you have all of your, your week content broken out, week one, week two, week, week three, week four. And at least in Blackboard, you can create uh, a link to just the assignments under the assignments folder so they would live both in the weekly folder and in a folder that read assignments that way if the students knew what week they needed to be in they could go right in there and everything's there um, and if they didn't they can just click on assignments and they'll see all of the assignments that are due and and, um, and enter it that way and um, just really quickly jonathan i think i just got an email i think from someone that um is still saying that they're having trouble with spark or the spark presentation isn't um isn't what they're really looking for. And so what I do have, if you email me, um, I don't have the presentation in a PDF format, but I do have the layout of the template and what is basically, what each section would include in a PDF document. So I can share that with you. And then in the body of the email, I can just copy and paste those tools and tips um, for you. So if you just wanna send me an email, if the Spark isn't working, I can send that, I can send that out to you by this evening. Yeah, it's a it's a balance um, to play for sure, right? Uh, of making things available, but also making sure that they have. I'm sorry, Chase. I'm referring to a, a question in the chat. Um, also making sure that they have everything that they need, uh, all the instructions, all the um, resources, and things like that. So it, it's it's a balancing act for sure. Um, on social presence, one way, perhaps, is to talk to the online learners as you would in person. I know. Yeah. I think that that's a, a great technique, right? Um, a lot of the time in our, per, our professional emails, we're, we're taught to be concise and, and straight to the point and get the message across. Um, but sometimes lighting, lightening that up, adding some humor and injecting your own personality into the announcements or the email communications to your students um, does go a long way to creating that social presence. Uh, as another suggestion, uh, I worked with a faculty um, in doing her introduction video and you know she was like well i could come into the studio or i can just do it around here um, and there was a really nice park where she lived and so she went out to a park with her phone and did it from there so she could show the students a little bit of the area where she lives obviously not her house or anything specific like that but you know the seattle area in general um, and creating that that personal experience that way um, but yeah the technique you mentioned is a really great tool as well I think right now too, um, Jonathan, if I may, what I'm hearing from a lot of students, they're just as worried and just as panicked as, as some of our faculty that are going online for the first time. And so they're kind of getting antsy and curious and wondering, you know, where to find things, how to get started. So I think, you know, um, using any form of announcement in the beginning to kind of ease their stress a little bit and give them a little bit of reassurance and also humanizing that online environment 
you know, put your photo up there, create, you know, a live little recording that, that, that um, where they can see you, they can hear you and they can make a connection with you as well. Um, I think it's, those are all nice things to do, especially right now during this transition um, to help our students uh, feel like this is a inviting online experience and environment for them. So just a little bit of feedback, recommendation. I know we only have one more minute, so I wanna to try to get through this. Tracy, they're asking for if they can get a copy of the template. Uh, what would probably be the best way to do that? Yeah, go ahead and email me. I sent my email through chat, um, so I will send it again right now. Just email me and I could send you a PDF of that. All right, uh, in, in, I work in high school. We work primarily in modules. Do you find this more challenging for instructional design? Uh, if you're referring to basically like modules instead of weeks, uh, for me, no, I, I, I kind of look at them interchangeably. For me, a module is just a little bit more flexible than a week. It allows me to extend to a week and a half or two weeks if I need to. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but if, if that's what you're referring to, I, I use them pretty interchangeably. And the last question, because I have one more minute, uh, what do you use to record and CC your videos? Can you recommend us a tool recording? We generally do in a studio um, or through like Zoom or Camtasia or something like that. As far as closed captioning, we rely heavily on our accessibility team that I think does business with automatic sync technologies. It's a pay for caption service. Uh, we also utilize the YouTube captioning and then making some edits. I'm done, Cecilia, you're here. I see you, but I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Jonathan. Finishing up there right on time. Uh, I saw you coming to kick me that. out. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not kicking anybody out. But <laughs> I want to thank Jonathan and Tracy for presenting today. So, you know, thank you guys very much. I know that we had to switch this over to virtual versus a face to face. So it was, you know, everybody scrambled to get their presentations ready so they could do them in Zoom. And I really appreciate all your hard work. And thank you, everybody, for attending this session. And we're now going to go on break. All right. Thank you guys for coming. And thank you, Cecilia, for running the whole thing and making sure this runs smooth. We really appreciate your efforts as well. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.